Amen? So we're excited about that. Matthew chapter 26, verse 27, it says, Then he took a cup, and we had given thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, you will not drink from the fruit of this vine now, from now until that day, when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I want to conclude this series of teachings on faith, in Faith University with this subject in our time together today, family. Here it is. Let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. Clap your hands in this house if you're ready for the word, family. I want to leap into this lesson today with a question. It's really a question for your reflection. Here it is. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you agreed to do something in the past <laughs> but if you honestly and objectively audited your feelings in the present you would admit you had hesitancy about executing that agreement Maybe the people online will be more honest and authentic with me. In other words, have you ever agreed to do something, be somewhere, contribute something, and then when it came time to carry out your commitment, your present self looked at your past self, had an intervention with you, and interrogated you, and asked you, what was I thinking? Okay, I've got, I feel some love in this section right here. Okay, well, yeah. Have you ever asked yourself, why did I say I was going to do this? <laughs> you find yourself secretly and silently anticipating some event that will give you a legitimate excuse to just back out. Oh, it looked like my tire. Needs a little air. <laughs> Look at your kids, babe. Did you cough? I think you cough. I'm not going to be able to make it. My baby's coming down with something. Listen to me. Let, <laughs> let me neutralize this notion that if you've ever wrestled with that reality, you're evil. That doesn't make you evil, it makes you human. It, it is simply an indication that you are not an eternal God who knows all things. That you are a not an eternal God who operates with omnipotence and who can do all things. Although we should do our best to make our yes mean yes and our no mean no, all, although as people of faith, we should do our best to keep our commitments We must also operate within the confines of the revelation and the reality that as pure as my intentions are at times and as genuine as I was when I made this commitment, there are some commitments that I make I can't keep. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, it doesn't mean that an individual is indecisive or unreliable. It simply means that, there's a, that there was a degree and a dimension of information that I had when I made this commitment in my past that I did not have as I walked into my present. And as a consequence of this, are y'all all right? Sometimes humans make commitments they can't keep God on the other hand does operate with omniscience and omnipotence so he only says what he means and he always means what he says 
Because he possesses all power, he's got the ability to always execute what he agrees on. In other words, whereas you and I sometimes make commitments, we can keep God. Never makes a commitment that he can't keep. And we need to remember this revelation when we are wrestling with tough times, family. Watch this. We must find comfort in the consistency and in the capability of God. We need to regularly remind ourselves of what God can do. We need to remind ourselves, like the Bible teaches, he's able to make water come from a rock. What does that mean? It means that looking, when you initially observe a rock, a rock doesn't look like it contains water. But God is able to get stuff from some things that you didn't even realize and recognize had that potential. He's able to give you and I unusual provision from unexpected places. Has anybody ever been in a season in your life and God sent you some water from a rock? He sent you provision from unexpected places? Yeah, the Bible teaches us he, he can bring water from a rock. The, the Bible teaches us he can turn water into wine. What does that mean? It means that he's able to do something different without giving you something new. I'm going to say that one more time. It means that he's able to do something different without giving you something new. It means he can do a new thing at an old job. He can do a new thing with the same spouse. Come on now, you can have a different marriage and not have to have a different partner. Did you hear what I just said? You can have different impact with the same ability because some of us are underutilizing and underestimating the capability that's been divinely deposited on the inside of us. Some of us are like Moses, standing by a red sea, feeling overwhelmed and disadvantaged, wanting God to divinely intervene by adding something to us. And God's like, I don't even have to give you nothing new to give you a breakthrough. Moses, what's in your hand? I'm gonna show you how to use something you've been walking with and show you how to use it to part red seas I don't know who this is for today I wish somebody would talk back to me but I want you to know that God can do a new thing with an old stick we, we, we should find comfort in the capability of God somebody shout he's able they didn't say it loud put it in the chat say he's able yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we should find confidence in the capability of God. Listen to me. However, as we conclude this series of sermons on Faith University, I think it's important for me to lift up something that's incredibly important but might be initially uncomfortable. <laughs> Not only is it important to regularly remind ourselves of what God can do. It is equally important if you're going to walk and live by faith to regularly remind ourselves of what he can't do. See that? Three claps in here. Somebody in the chat give me some fire. Some, I said... It is important to regularly remind ourselves of what he can do, but if we're going to walk by faith, we also need to be equally aware of what he can't do. The scripture suggests that there is something that God can't do. The Bible articulates that there is something that he is incapable of. What is it, Darius? He can't lie. You missed it. I said he can't lie. And I know many of us are accustomed to being encouraged to praise God for what he can do. I want to know, is there anybody at Change Church watching me on the online campus that will say, I've got the, I've got the audacity and I've got the gall to praise God for what he can't do. What you praising him for? For what he can't do. He said, no weapon formed against me shall prosper he can't lie 
He said he supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. He can't lie. He said I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. He can't lie. He said my enemies will come at me one way but they got to flee seven ways. He can't lie. He said I'll bless those that bless you. Come here. I'll curse those that curse you. He can't lie. I want to give you 15 seconds to pause and praise God that he can't lie. Come on. You'll sleep better at night if you just recognize he can't lie. There'll be more joy in your heart if you just accept that he can't lie. He can't lie. He can't lie. He's incapable of lying because of the effectual nature of his word. His word's different than ours. Inherent, his word is effectual, not just effective. It's effectual because inherent in the word is creative power. So even if when he speaks a thing, it doesn't exist by the time he speaks it, his word creates it. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, when, that, when he looked out into the, when he looked out in the creation narrative and saw nothing and the earth was filled with darkness, he said, let there be. And because his word is effectual in nature, it's got creative power inherent in it. When he speaks it, he creates it. So even when Gideon is weak, when God calls him a mighty warrior, the word goes to working on Gideon's heart. And Gideon's heart has to line up with the word. I don't know who this is for today, but I'm coming to tell somebody that the word's getting ready to work on you. Hey, you may came in here broken, you may be watching this broken, but when the word comes to you, it's going to start working on your heart and putting the broken pieces of your heart back together again. Somebody give him praise and drop some fire in that chair. He can't lie. He takes what he says seriously. And our foundational text here in Matthew exposes us to a word that is repeatedly and regularly used to describe how seriously God takes his statements. It's right here in Matthew chapter 26, family. Jesus engaging in what many of us have come to know as the Last Supper is having a conversation with his mentees and his disciples. And although this conversation is often used to teach us and talk to us about communion, this, this conversation isn't about communion. This conversation is about covenant. He's using communion as a communication tool to make sure that his apprentices, his disciples know I'm establishing a new covenant. Am I in the book now? Am I teaching the Bible? No, 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 no. When it's not just about the bread and the wine. Come on, they weren't just turning up on a Thursday. It was Thursday. <laughs> it was Thursday night. That last supper was Thursday. Like, oh my God, Tuesday. No, the last supper was Thursday. My God, Pastor, get with it. <laughs> no, the last supper wasn't Tuesday, it was Thursday. Yeah, the communion is just metaphors. When he takes the bread, he said, Hey, this is just a symbol of my body. He said, This is not about the bread, this is just a symbol of my body. Then he takes the fruit of the vine and the wine. He says, this isn't about the wine. This is a symbol of my blood. But the text says, he says, are you, are you following me? The text says, this is the blood of the covenant. So he says, this isn't just about communion. This is about a covenant. Look at me. 
God, no, take us, write this down. Somebody put this in the chat. God doesn't just state promises. God makes covenants. Come here. I don't know how we build our faith without this revelation. God does not just state promises. He makes covenants. He is a covenant God. The name that is used to describe him most in the Old Testament, Jehovah, is his covenant name. The Bible is a covenant book. The word testament means covenant or agreement. Are you here? So the Old Testament is the old covenant or the old agreement. And the New Testament is the new covenant and the new agreement we are people of covenant this is why in the old testament and the new testament he uses the metaphor of marriage to describe his relationship with us <laughs> he said I'm married to the backslider y'all better come get me today I said you better come get me today he said I'm married to the backslider I don't break covenant. Even when you walk away from me and you aren't all you say you're supposed to be, I steal them everything. Come on now. This is the way they used to say it in the church I grew up in. He's been better to me than I've been to myself. It's because he's a covenant keeper. So are y'all following me here? God's a covenant God. Jehovah's his covenant name. The Bible is a covenant book. Just think about that. If you see the Bible as a covenant book, you read it differently. Are y'all here? Yeah, you're not just reading a religious book. You're reading an agreement that the divine made with me. <laughs> Are you here? Okay, here it is. Th this is a little difficult for us to wrap our head around because the word covenant is not a word we really use a lot in our current context we use the word contract got me but a covenant in the contract are y'all ready for this so let me give you a Daniel's definition of a covenant a covenant is a binding agreement established by love but enforced by law established by love excuse me enforced like law what do you mean established by love here it is Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 12 says if you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love do you see this? He will keep his covenant of love. See, it's a love covenant. See, this, this is <laughs> what makes it a love covenant. In most covenants and contracts, there is some benefit that expresses itself mutually. If we're in a covenant or a contract together, I get something and you get something. God's covenant is a covenant of love because it's not mutually beneficial. Y'all aren't here. Are you following me? It is not mutually beneficial. He says, what do I need to come into an agreement with you for? What can you give me that I already don't have? why do I want to come into covenant with you because Pastor Darius already helped you acknowledge that you make commitments you can't keep so it's a love covenant because I make a deal with you and you're the only one that gets something out of the deal but I love you so much I'm going to come into agreement with you because you need the comfort of the covenant my word is my word 
so I don't need a covenant to force me to keep my word but I'm going to come into covenant with you because the covenant makes you feel more comfortable y'all let me go to this next thing. I wish somebody I wish somebody was following me today I said God doesn't need to legally obligate himself to force himself to keep his word he only says what he means and he means what he says but God comes into covenant with us because we need the comfort of a covenant are you here he says so I'm going to establish this in love the only reason I'm doing this is because I love you but I'm going to enforce it like it's law I'm, a, <laughs> I'm going to bind myself to it like it's law I'm going to obligate myself to do something I would or, ordinarily be obligated to do he says so when I say I'll supply all your needs I don't have to do that when I say no weapons formed against you shall prosper I don't have to do that but I obligate myself to do it not because I need the obligation but you need the comfort of knowing I make good on my word and it may not happen today and it may not happen tomorrow but his word will not return to him void it will accomplish all that he sent it out to do it will prosper the thing wherein he sent it he said this is my new covenant established in blood why did Jesus say blood he says okay I want you to understand how seriously I'm taking this Leviticus 17 11 says for the life of the creature the life of the flesh is in the blood so when, when Jesus says this is a blood covenant he's saying it is the equivalent of someone putting their life on the line regarding how serious they are about keeping their word so I'm not giving you a Jan, John Hancock I'm giving you blood That's how serious I am about keeping my word. So this, this blood covenant, which makes atonement for our sin and secures our forgiveness, also adopts us into the family of God, which is why Paul says, if you be Christ, now you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So now the covenant agreement, the will, the testament that applies only to God's children, not creation. Did you hear what I just said? We all got church. No, we're all God's creation. You're his children if you see him as father. This is why when Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he didn't say, say our creator. Don't you mess with me. He said, I want you to say our father. Because I want you to know you're talking to your daddy. And your daddy made an agreement with you. <laughs> he says, no, you've been adopted into my family. So now, the will that's reserved for my children is a will you now have access to. If you be Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise therefore I think we need to ask a question right if all of this is true why does Jesus need to have this conversation why you know why go through you got the bread you got the wine why go through all of that if it is what it is it is what it is why do we have to have a conversation about it here it is maybe because Jesus knew their experience with it is tied to their awareness of it. It's possible to have a covenant you're not conscious of. And what you aren't conscious of, you can't benefit from. Let me go to this, Sassus Terror. I said 
It is possible to have a covenant we aren't conscious of. And if we aren't conscious of it, we can't benefit from it. And this is one of the schemes, the methods, the wiles of the adversary. He's called the prince of darkness because darkness is a metaphor for evil and ignorance. And he wants to keep us ignorant and unaware, come on, of the covenant agreement that God's made with us. Because you can't believe for what you're unaware of. You can't pursue what you don't believe has been promised. So something can be given to you rightfully yours and you be unaware of it because you're not living with covenant consciousness. And Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm getting ready to leave you. And you so worried about me leaving that you don't realize the covenant is staying. Hey, I'm leaving you, but I'm leaving you with a covenant agreement. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Do y'all have a few minutes? Huh? Y'all tired or you got five minutes? What about seven? Okay, here it is. <laughs> listen, listen. This is what many people are wondering. You are like me, you're wondering. If you are like me, you're wondering, how do I know if I have covenant consciousness? I think I do, but how do I know? Covenant consciousness reveals itself always three ways. I see three ways a person who's living with covenant consciousness. I, I, I see three ways in scripture that covenant consciousness reveals itself, reveals and exposes itself. Here it is. Number one, when a person lives with covenant consciousness, the Bible teaches they live with a different type of confidence. <laughs> Darius, what do you mean? How many, you're familiar with the story of David and Goliath? If, put yes in the chat. Say, say yes if you're familiar with the story. Okay. David and Goliath. Okay. So here's something that's really significant that I think is often overlooked about that story. I'm going to read it to you. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26, the Bible says this. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Now, I'm not even going to bother that. That alone will preach. Every entrepreneur needs to read that and think. What will, if I, I'm not going to bother this too much. <laughs> but but, but he, he, here's, let's stay disciplined. Here it is right here. But that'll preach right there. That debunks a lot of religious programming regarding mo. Okay, because <laughs> I go a little deep and say, now, are we gonna question David's motives here? What? <laughs> here it is. I got to stay disciplined. Here it is. Here, <laughs> here it is. Here it is. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy? See, if you just read over that, you miss everything. Pastor Desiree, see, in David's day, God's people on the eighth day were circumcised. It was a sign and a symbol of covenant. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. It's a sign and a symbol of covenant, of covenant. So Goliath is way taller than David. Goliath is stronger than David. Goliath has a more robust and impressive military background than David. Goliath has more weapons, watch this, better weapons than David. He's got a sword and a spear. David's got a slingshot and some rocks. But David looked at that Philistine and said, you come at me with a sword and a spear. But I come at you in the name of the living God. He looked at that Philistine and said, the same God that delivered me from out of the mouth of the lion and the bear is the same God that will deliver you into my hands. Why? Because you have a sword. You have a spear. You have height. You have strength. You have experience. But I have a covenant. Hey! 
hallelujah. And because I got a covenant, my God agrees not to let me fight by myself. All you see is me, but you best believe it's more than me up in here, up in here. I got the armies of God fighting for me. I need my Baptist members now. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me. Are y'all here? So his confidence wasn't in the slingshot. And this is why some Christians are losing. Because you think it's your slingshot. You think it's your, no, 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 no. Don't you mess with me. Yeah, yeah. He hit Goliath right at the weak and vulnerable point in Goliath's armor. So he had skill, but he realized skill alone won't kill this giant. And some of, us, some of our Goliaths are killing our joy, killing our peace, killing our focus, and killing our progress because you think it's your stone. Speak, Holy Spirit. Can I have five minutes, please? His confidence was in the covenant. He said, he uncircumcised. I got the one thing he need. <laughs> see, I'm just, see, sometimes we don't even fight the Goliath because we're looking at the fact, I don't have a sword. I don't have a spear. I don't have their education. I don't have their connections. I don't have their experiences. I don't have their race. I don't have their gender. I don't have their age. I don't have their money. I'm not as articulate. I'm not as comfortable in social settings. It doesn't matter what you don't have. I want to know, do you know what you do have? And you do have a covenant. And as long as I got King Jesus. See, there's, I gotta go. There's a difference between, see, I can tell covenant consciousness by praise. Because there's a casual praiser and there's a covenantal praiser. A praise that flows from the revelation. God's got an agreement with me. And it hadn't happened today and it might not happen tomorrow. But they that wait. Upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount upon the wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not faint. Covenant. Covenant number two. I got to go. Number two. So it gives you confidence. You understand? You have confidence when you're facing Goliath. But you know, God's got an agreement with me. Gives you confidence. Number two, it gives you clarity. It gives you clarity on what you can realistically expect God to do. See, I cannot tell you, I'm a pastor, and I'm telling you right now, 95% of the people that defect from the faith, defect out of disappointment with God. I've been at this church 16 years and I've been in church all my life. And I am telling you, 95% of the people that I have seen defect from the faith, defect and leave the faith over some sort of disappointment with God that is rooted in an expectation that God would do something he never agreed to do. You're not helping me here. We will read Job in the Bible. And then if we have a Job-like season, 
we will look at God as if God isn't doing something he promised he would do. He said, I put Job in the Bible so that you can see. Sometimes the unexplainable happens. That sometimes some bad things happen to good people. Sometimes a good wife get a bad husband. See, y'all not ready to talk this talk today. Yeah, we just want, we want Mary had a little lamb. Won't he do it? Won't he make a early? No, 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 no. Sometimes y'all aren't talking to me. Sometimes you're good to people and they get convenient amnesia. You said yes your whole life and now they're throwing a temper tantrum because you gave them one note. Y'all aren't talking to me. We need clarity on exactly what God promised. Does that make sense? So I can say, I got a covenant. But if I don't have clarity on what that means and what that entails, okay, media team, let's get creative here. I'm about to, about to hopscotch, all right. Uh, in the back, get ready. I'm about to hopscotch. Here it is. Listen to me. Not literally. I'm talking about my notes. All right. Here it is. <laughs> they like, okay, get the camera ready. Get his feet right now. In three, two, one, camera one. Now, feet go. No, that's, that's not, I'm not, not, not. Not literally, that's not what I'm about. That's not what I'm about. <laughs> but if I just tell you God's got a covenant with you and, and you don't have clarity, does that make sense? Then you'll be holding God to agreements that he didn't make. Does that make sense? So, Dr. Des, give me a little clarity on, on, on covenants. Okay, are y'all ready for this real quick? So, here, here's number one. God's covenant, some parts of God's covenant has prerequisites. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God, so there, 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 there's agreement there are parts of the covenant that are unconditional where God says no matter what I'm going to be this come on yeah but then there are some parts that are conditional we call them if then promises Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19 says if you are willing and obedient you will eat the good of the land. So I can't get mad at God if I'm not eating the good of the land. God said, no, no, that promise had a prerequisite. Now, why is God putting prerequisites in place? All the prerequisites, watch this, watch this. Any prerequisite isn't God asking anything extra. Any prerequisite is just God asking you to be obedient. He's just using the covenant promise as a motivator. Boy, if I had time, a motivator to motivate you because he knows we've been wired to respond to reward or consequence. So he says you need to be willing and obedient anyway. But in order to motivate you to be willing and obedient, I'm going to attach a promise to that prerequisite so that you'll eat the good of land. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? All right, all right, all right. So God, some promises have prerequisites. Y'all follow me? All right, Lord have mercy. If my people... who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray seek my face turn from their wicked ways 
then, then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal the land. Why isn't the land healed? Because prayer is anemic in the body. The body doesn't pray. Seek ye first the kingdom. I got the call. And this righteousness. And then all these things, what things? The things that the Gentiles seek after. Who's a Gentile? A person that's not in covenant. See? You, you, boy, I don't have time. When, when a believer doesn't have, co- I need a whole series on covenant. When a believer doesn't have covenant consciousness, they live like Gentiles. They thirsty, just like Gentiles. No, the Bible says Gentiles have to be thirsty. They got to run it down, chase it down. The Bible says when I live with a kingdom consciousness and I put the king first, the stuff that they manipulate and run after, come on. I don't have to chase it. God will cause it to chase me. And some people are exhausted and they're frustrated and they're disappointed because they're grinding and that grind not working, is it? God no. He said, he said you're trying to do it their way, but you're not them. They got the grind because they're working for themselves. They got the grind because they all they got. You got me. And if I be for you, I'm more than the world against you. You don't have to destroy your soul to reach your goal. Y'all not talking to me. Y'all not talking to me. You don't have to mess up your castle to build an empire. You don't have to do it that way. You don't have to destroy your body to reach your destiny. You ain't got to worry yourself to death to reach your goals. No, no, no. Go to sleep. No sleep, team, no sleep. You right, you don't sleep because you don't have covenant. Covenant people sleep. I got to sleep, wake up, secure the bag, and then go back to sleep. Oh my God, I feel something getting ready to break out in here. I feel some people that are refusing to live like everybody else because you got a revelation that I'm a covenant people. I'm done, son. Play softly and slow so I'll quit. I just got to stop. Y'all just stand up. Just stand up. Just. The next service started already. Here it is. <laughs> They're in praise and worship right now. Confidence. Clarity. You need clarity on the prerequisites. I'm going to give y'all this so that y'all won't be mad if West Hampton start talking about the notes they got. He didn't give us that. There are prerequisites, but here's a part of the covenant. Protection. I have a covenant of protection. Now, this is what happens, guys. We make assumptions about what that protection looks like. Protection isn't always avoiding trouble. These are two ways God protects. Avoidance or empowerment to overcome what you don't avoid. When when it rained 40 days and 40 nights, Moses didn't get to move to another part of the earth where there was no rain. He got rained on. God just showed him how to build the ark so that he could float when everybody else was drowning. 
so sometimes when it happens, we say, God's not protecting me. No, 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 no. Sometimes God protects you from it. And then like the Hebrew boy, sometimes he protects you in it. And somebody can testify because you're in the middle of something right now. You're in the, and people can't look at you and tell because you don't wear it on the outside and, and you're not articulating your issues to everybody because some of you don't even have a, a, a life support system of people around you that actually, I got to do, I got to teach on this too, that actually care about you. God showed me something. Y'all want, can I share it with you? He showed it something for me, but can I share it with you? People's love for you is not revealed when you give them your yes. It's revealed when you give them your no. How do they respond to you when you make a decision that's best for you? I don't like this, but it's best for me. I liked it the old way, but I was killing myself. I liked the old you. The old me was depressed. I was insecure. I was being manipulated. I was a people pleaser. You like the old me. I don't like the old me. Are you here? God said, I'm going to give you protection. Three, he said, I'm going to give you provision. That's what the tithe is about, y'all. The tithe is about coming in agreement. Listen, I'm just telling you right now, there are people that don't tithe and they eat, so let's just stop saying, if you don't tithe, you're not going to eat. It's people eating right now that don't tithe. The thing is, they're calling, they're calling, they're saying, I live in the blessings of God, but it's mercy. And that's what's sad. It's like you settling for mercy. There are God, there are people God opens doors for that don't tie. Well, you tied, you're saying, okay, God, this is this is the prerequisite. You said the first tenth of everything that I have, when I give that, I come into agreement with you regarding the financial part of our covenant. And this is what he promises. He promises, see, we got to teach this right. Because when you teach it wrong, people try it, it don't work, then they don't believe it. Teach the truth. Truth works. Here it is. It didn't say, uh, he, said, he didn't say, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out money. That's not what he said. So we teach that, people give, and they like, I don't see it. He said, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out blessing." Sometimes you need a blessing, not just money. Your children sick, you don't want money. When you're about to lose your mind, you don't want money. When your heart is broken and you can't even focus. See, y'all don't know, y'all know that kind of pain. You don't know that kind of pain where your heart is so broken that you look forward to going to sleep because that's the only time your mind rests. You don't know what I'm talking about. When that happens, you want a blessing. You want a sound mind. So an open heaven means this. God's like, there is no God-ordained opportunity you will miss. That when you live under an open heaven, if they tell you no, you know that's not me. If the door closed, you know that's not me. You don't have to worry about, am I correcting you? You know that what is for me is going to come to me because God agrees I live under an open heaven. And what did he say? He said, he said, this is what I do when you tithe. I open heaven and I rebuke the devourer. So the thing that's eating up what you do have, I start rebuking that. So that you're able to have more even when you don't have more. Oh my. Some of you better praise God because that's what happened in the pandemic. Somehow, some way, God showed you how to stretch what you had and how to make it last. Because that's part of my covenant. 
there's a prerequisite, I give you protection and I give you provision. And when you have that, you get confidence. And when you get clarity on the way that covenant works, the last C is this, you have calmness. Now watch this. I hadn't learned yet how to have, are you, can y'all handle this realness? I'm not the same guy I was before the pandemic. And some of y'all gonna like that and some of you aren't. Because this pandemic, if y'all thought I was real and righteously raw before the pandemic, we're not playing no games now. We're not playing games. People locked in their homes, loved ones dying. We can't be playing no games. So, so we got to keep it real. So I haven't learned yet how to have a life filled with zero anxiety. Now, I don't have to tell you that. I'm telling you that to set you free. But I don't live an anxious life. All their moments was like, woo, I feel it. Yeah, I feel it. But then the Holy Ghost come. Or I use some of the tools I've learned. Reframing. The story I tell myself. The words that I let come out of my mouth. When I feel it coming, I don't feed it. I starve it. And when I starve it, it dies. So I'm not telling you that when you live with a covenant consciousness for the rest of your life, there will never be an experience where you don't have a little anxiety. Is this all? See? Sorry. Now this was, please, I'm telling you now, I got, a little, I got a little Jesus spirit in me. I do have a little clap back in this season. So please don't email me or DM me about, no, you need to be in faith because when you're in faith, you have, well, God bless you if that's where you are. I'm being honest with my people about where I am. Every now and then, it creep up on me. I just know what to do with it when it comes. I starve it instead of feeding it. So what, what does that mean? It means I live a calm life. On this platform, or if you're with me off this platform, people will tell you, Darius is Darius. God got it. I, I don't know. God's got it. Because covenant consciousness helps us live calm. How many want that? Lord, I want to be more calm. Lord, I know I can go to zero to 100. I can go to zero to 100. My mind can get to, get to going and take me to some dark places. God, I just want to be calm. I know everything's not going to be perfect, but I'm just tired of being stressed. I've been stressed too long. Lord, I just want to be, I just want some peace. See, there are some people in here that want a house, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I believe there are more people that are in here and watching this. You say, Darius, I just want to be happy right now I just want a season can I just have a season where I don't have to I know I'm gonna, I, don't, I know I'm gonna have to worry but can I just have a season covenant consciousness God keeps his word he's gonna keep it for you I said he's gonna keep it to you I said he's gonna keep it to you can I pray for you Why I keep y'all in church so long? <laughs> oh. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over every person watching this. I pray over every person in this room that we will live with a covenant consciousness. You made a deal with us. So this is what I pray for in their life. I pray for the manifestation of this in their life. I pray for more confidence. In the name of Jesus, that as they face their Goliath, I pray for confidence. I pray for clarity. 
And finally, Father, I pray for calmness. Calm our nerves. Hi, my, my. Oh, glory to God that we would be anxious for nothing. That we walk in the peace of God that passes all understanding. God, I thank you for this. And I give you praise. Thank you for this series. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our teacher and professor. We thank you for these things and we ask this blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. This ends Faith University. Class dismissed.